Hello everyone. So we're going to finish up this psychology course in this term with a presentation about Viktor Frankl and as you know he was the uh, third of the humanist psychologists that I proposed to you to study, Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow being the other two. So Viktor Frankl, as you probably remember me telling you in class, was the Austrian psychiatrist who was um, grabbed by the SS, by the Nazis, and uh, put in a concentration camp. And as a result of his concentration camp uh, experiences and his own particular um, perspective on uh, what it means to be human and the human spirit, he uh, wrote his very famous book, Man's Search for Meaning. So. Um, one of the one of his um, uh, difficulties with psychology in the uh, 50s when he emerged from the camps was that it was uh, dominated by the determinism that uh, we saw in or that the world saw in behaviorism that at that point had really been an extreme version of behaviorism he uh, says that behaviorism was or is uh, deterministic and I'd like you to uh, think about examples uh, in how that might be true. Um, behaviorism today is not as extreme as it was uh, in the 50s and 60s. It has been uh, tempered with um, cognitive therapy and so today we might call it, call it uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. So what is determinism? Well, let me uh, just uh, do what is not cool to do and I'll read directly from the slide. So it is the view that we do not have much control over our actions but are controlled by factors such as our biology or our genes or by the way we are brought up. As a result of this, uh, determinists believe that we are mainly passive responders to our past or to our biology or to our environment and that we have no free will. So determinism is this belief that for every event there is an antecedent cause. Antecedent meaning something that comes before. So determinists believe then that it's possible to predict behavior by determining the cause of behavior. Well, not just determinists, but also, I mean, that's the study of psychology, isn't it? It's the the study of behavior and mental processes and one of the reasons that we study that is because we want to be able to predict behavior so we, that we can help uh, uh, people be, uh, be healthy. So from a determinist point of view um, this means that someone other than yourself can possibly understand you better than you understand your own self. But humanistic psychology develops uh, as what we call today a third force and it is another way of seeing human behavior. Um, it was uh, mostly uh, influenced by uh, the events of uh, the war and the movement uh, that we today call existentialist uh, philosophy. It emphasizes the goodness and the health uh, and the desire of the human being to uh, be the best that they can be and so in psychological terms you would say grow to uh, wholeness or individuation. So humanistic psychology then believes that growth and health are natural states for people, which is, as you know, uh, not what Freud said. I love this quote from Maslow, if you deliberately plan on being less than you are capable of being, then I warn you that you'll be unhappy for the rest of your life. Um, I wonder where he got that from because that really sounds like Viktor Frankl, but you know, it's um, thinkers influence one another. So it's important that you understand that these are very, very different views from Freud and from Skinner. And so here are our humanist psychologists. I love this photo of Viktor Frankl and I wonder at what time it was taken because you see the, the wires behind him. Uh, you can only speculate that it might have been after his liberation. So humanistic psychology or the third force um, was a reaction to uh, the extreme determinism that really believed that, you know, uh, man can never be more than uh, whatever he is quote unquote programmed to be and the program can be from, <clears throat> excuse me, from your, your genes, it can also be from uh, your environment because remember that 
um, Watson believed uh, that he could create any kind of human being uh, that he wanted uh, as long as he could control the environment uh, 100%. So uh, that's humanistic psychology is a reaction to what we call biological reductionism, which just really pretty much means that you can't be more than your programming. So if you think of a robot, think of data from Star Trek, data whose one desire is to be human, well, it's always beyond his grasp because whatever that thing is that belongs to humans is not in his programming and therefore he can never be. So the first force you remember is uh, Pavlov and uh, Watson and classical conditioning. The emphasis on objectivity, uh, obviously reinforced by the scientific method. And the second force uh, was the neo-Freudian, so neo means that which comes after, so the Freudian thinkers after Freud, such as uh, Alfred Adler and Carl Jung, those are the second force and they are the ones who continued with Fro uh, Freudian thinking and so they emphasized the unconscious mind and the depth of the psyche. <coughs> Um, but they also asserted that uh, you could have access to those uh, unconscious depths and, uh, you, and, you, and you needed to do that so that you could uh, integrate all those different parts of you to become um, a whole human being and they uh, instituted something called depth psychology. And remember that Freud believed that you, know, that you could not access that unconscious uh, id and uh, uh, well, you could, but only by dreams and by Freudian analysis. So that was pretty much the opposite of any sort of scientific method. <clears throat> so the neo-Freudians and the classical behaviorists uh, both disregarded the importance of the conscious mind where we make our decisions and our rational uh, mental processes. So Viktor Frankl writes this book, Man's Search for Meaning, and in this book he characterizes uh, human existence. Um, there are three things that make us human, that make us different from um, artificial uh, intelligence and from uh, animals. Uh, and here are those three things, that there's a dimension to human life that is spiritual, that is uh, not quantifiable, and that uh, man is free, that that is a basic human condition of, of life, of human life, and that that freedom then means that we are responsible. If we derive the ego and the superego from the id, what we achieve is not a correct picture of man, but a caricature of man. And that's Frankl's words, and caricature just, you know, it's a cartoon. It's a cartoon version of man. So <clears throat> the gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of this theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and the environment, or as the Nazis like to say, of blood and soil. So think about this for a second. If we are the product of this unconscious thing that rules us, the id, well, how can we have any say in who we become if we are uh, controlled by something that we are, by definition, not aware of and incapable of being aware of? And uh, this a quote from um, Frankel, when we present man as an automaton, and so that's kind of like a robot of reflexes, as a mind machine, as a bundle of instincts, as pawn, a pawn of drives and reactions, as a mere product of instinct, heredity, heredity and environment, we feed the nihilism to which modern man is in any case prone. And so nihilism um, uh, is a, uh, I don't want to call it a philosophy, but you know, let's call it a philosophy because if you take a philosophy class, you'll probably learn that as a philosophy. But it, it's sort of a, a, a reaction to uh, um, this European idea after the war, uh, actually even before the war, that uh, there is absolutely no point in anything. There, there are no values beyond that which you uh, assert as a value, that everything is absolutely relative to the person. And if everything is absolutely relative, then there are no ultimate standards of good and evil or anything. And then there is actually no anything, and then there's no point, and there's no meaning. And uh, if there's no meaning, well, what's the point? So Frankel's um, 
uh, humanism and, and uh, humanistic psychology or logotherapy he called it is a uh, is a reaction to this uh, this belief that was uh, uh, in his and but in his uh, social uh, uh, environment in his context so he calls it um, logotherapy and it's all about uh, man's desire to find meaning and so it's not only a desire it is it's an absolute uh, uh, it, it's a um, it's a force in our lives uh, we absolutely must find meaning and for him uh, depression was a person who um, who had lost uh, meaning so he asserted that you know human beings can survive anything if they find meaning in it um, he loved to say that uh, he had this equation um, and perhaps you could pa you could uh, write this down after you hear me say it so D is equal to S minus M and that means despair or depression is equal to suffering minus or without the meaning so if we suffer for no point um, we've, we we're just in pain and there's no there's no understanding of it and there's no point to it uh, then we are truly in the depth of despair and depression so logotherapy then is not uh, a want the the desire for meaning the search for meaning it's an absolute need uh, for all human beings it's not a, a secondary uh, need something that we think about when we've got everything else done in our life like at the top of the pyramid but it's really something that um, he actually wouldn't even put on a pyramid but it's a primary motivation and if you pause the video and read that second little paragraph there to the right at the bottom uh, you will understand um, where he's coming from when he talks about our will for meaning and that how this is a primary motivation um, it's absolutely the thing that will allow us to uh, survive any horrific um, event, uh, any inner uh, despair. Um, there has to be a point. There has to be something bigger than ourselves and something for which we are willing to live and die. And so we certainly certainly can understand uh, uh, all of human history and the sacrifice of uh, uh, soldiers uh, everywhere going off to war. Uh, and and not just soldiers but anybody else who goes through something difficult in life and so um, this is a wonderful uh, clip from uh, you can find it on TED.com but you can just if you just put in Victor Frankl man search for meaning or just watch it right here later on uh, you'll see he's talking about his flying instructor who is teaching him uh, how to fly and he's describing how if you're aiming at a, uh, a point in the distance you can't uh, uh, calculate di directly at that point you have to calculate a little bit above it and he's using that as a metaphor to uh, explain uh, who he sees uh, man to be and so I'm going to let you watch that and uh, expect that you've uh, taken notes on this and uh, you are going to be ready for your essay test on Monday.